Hello and welcome to The Village Voice. I'm your host, Kathy Smith, which I've been experiencing some technical issues. You know, it could be because of the weather this evening. It could be just because everybody's Netflix and chilling at the moment. But hey, welcome. I appreciate you coming in tonight. And you know, in this time of uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, it's changed our whole world. It's really easy to get feeling, have a feeling of being isolated or even, you know, hopeless. But I want you all to know that we are still connected digitally, however, and I welcome you here to The Village Voice, where we're going to take a look at some of the things that are going on in the world a little bit more below, beyond the headlines and dig a little deeper into it. So this evening, I hope I've got a bunch of parents here who have uh, gotten their fuzzy slippers on. They've relaxed, put the kids in a secure location where they will not be disturbed, and they have their favorite glass of wine. So uh, please join me as we talk about some of the education and some of the things that are going on uh, with three of our top educators here in Charlotte. So uh, with no further ado, I welcome uh, Matt Henson from the Northwest School of the Arts, Nicole Halbiason, also from the Northwest School of the Arts, and David Wallace, um, who is coming here live from the John Crossland School. Well, not really live, but his house, but you get what I mean. Yeah, my house. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to see you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize. I've had some, some lag issues over here, and actually my computer wound up going down for a second and coming back up. So we're all here, right? We're all good? Everybody can hear everybody? Yep. Yeah. All right. We're good. Awesome. 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 So let's go ahead and get you guys introduced. So um, what I'd love to just kind of do a little, little round robin of everybody and, um, you know, tell everybody, you know, what school you come from, um, you know, how long you've been an educator, um, you know, and typically the size of your classroom and, and what's your discipline? What do you teach? So let's go ahead and start off with you, uh, Matt. Uh, I work over at Northwest School of the Arts. I teach musical theater grades uh, six through 12 and class sizes range anywhere from 20, well, about 20 students all the way up to 60. Um, and uh, what was the other question? Oh, 20 no, years. Wow. <laughs> this, this is my 20th and, and strangest year of I would have to remember. In a lot of things, it's the strangest year. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> Even as a realtor, it's kind of a strange year. Um, so, Nicole, tell us, uh, tell us about you. Uh, I also work at Northwest School for the Arts. I teach uh, AP English language and uh, English and yearbook and creative writing. Is there anything else? No, there's nothing How else so far. Uh, 15 <laughs> years. <laughs> this is my 15th year and uh, also probably the strangest year I've ever had. Um, and uh, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> and to be clear, since you've come to Northwest, you've had plenty of strange years. <laughs> yes, I have. So that is saying a lot that this is even stranger. Wow. Well, okay. Well, David, so has this been your strangest year of teaching? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty safe to say for every teacher I know at this point. <laughs> um, I've been teaching for eight years. This is So this is my eighth year in a um, classroom setting. Uh, last four years I've been at the John Carlson School, which is an independent school, and we specialize in uh, students with learning disabilities. And, uh, and your disciplines are? Oh, so um, primarily I'm a music teacher. Um, I'm also the extended day coordinator at John Carlson School, and I've taught drama and art a little bit. Um, at Crosland, we're a very, very small school. We only have 75 students total, I believe, and it's K through 12. Um, and so, of course, with a small school, uh, many of us wear many, many hats. So. Yeah. And, and I have to compliment you. I'm sorry. I just, I don't mean to notice this in the background, David, but not everyone has a trombone and a trumpet hanging from their coat rack. So the I is on the floor right behind, uh, right underneath okay. there. It's a brass ensemble. I get it. It's all together. <laughs> what do I do behind the computer, actually? <laughs> <laughs> Never far away. You know, the, my flute's just right around the corner. So trust me, they're, they're, my music stands right here for choral music. So I've got everything mm -hmm. right here. But uh, so I tell you what, let's, let's take our viewers through um, kind of, you know, what's gone on. Like now, now people obviously are pretty well versed in what goes on in classrooms and kind of the, the idea of Um, can you tell me kind of, you know, like where, how have things changed for you in regards to, uh, you know, teaching students, like how, making the transition online, what kind of things are you guys doing? 
Oh, me? Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I think that this has been quite a trial and error process. You know, I, I was, I'm not someone who has techno fear. I have techno joy. Um, most of my classroom was also simultaneously virtual as well as um, in the classroom, but I am not someone who is comfortable just being online. I have learned that about myself very quickly in this setting um, that I am, I desperately need to be in the classroom with the kids. And so my biggest um, goal has just been connecting with them and to make sure that, uh, you know, I have juniors this year, we turned in their graduation papers the last day that we were in session before we went wow. virtual. And so this is like what used to be the graduation paper in CMS and they have been working on it since September, October. Most of them, some of them had only been working on it since the night before, which, you know, that's fine. Um, that's typical. So, so this is months of their life and they're, you know, applying for scholarships and wanting to go. I mean, they had, everyone's talking about the seniors and how much they've lost. And yes, that's, that's, that's horrible too. And a lot of them are dealing with a lot of emotions right now. Uh, struggling. I just had a meeting about that yesterday with a lot of our staff about what we can do to try to supplement that. But there's other grades that are dealing with similar disappointments. The juniors who are not getting college days, not getting to do the prom. They're worried about AP exams. So there's a lot of concerns, you know, with the group that I work with. And so I've just, from day one, I really stepped up my game on Remind, where I had maybe not been as active on it this year. And, and mostly just checking in and sending them, most of the time I just send them memes that are funny and mm -hmm. comic strips that I love and things that I see that have been helping me because I have been very honest with them. I'm not dealing well with this. I, I think that that's one of the, one of the best ways, especially because I have older students to make them understand that it's okay to not be okay with this. It's fine. Um, I'm not okay with it still being positive, still being uplifting, still trying to reach them in a way that helps them see that I'm here for them and I miss them terribly. And I've gotten so many messages from, from students, just offhanded comments or emails or remind texts back saying, you know, things that have brought me to tears, just like, you know, thank you for being positive. Thank you for reminding us that you're here. Thank you for talking to us honestly about what's going on. And it's not fun to be honest in a situation like this as the adult in the room and as someone who prides herself on most of the time having an answer, I don't have any answers right now. And that's been the most frustrating part. And yeah. just being honest with the frustrations I think has, and connecting with them. Um, I have, I have been a lot more accessible that way to them than normal. And I think that it's helped them um, because some of them, even the ones that complain the loudest about going to school, are not happy with this situation. They're not thriving right now. So they they miss school, even though they don't want to be in school, they still miss school, so. Well, I was probably one of those kids myself, unless it was band or choir. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm good. I don't want to do, I don't want to go to school, I'm sick. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but so would you say your role, you know, kind of has changed because obviously, you know, you're you're not with them every single day. And that connection between you and the students is strong. So do you feel like you're more of, you know, I don't say a counselor or a confidant, but just somebody or a coach, you know, do you feel like your, your role has kind of changed? Um, th that has always been, those have always been hats that I've worn both like officially as coaches and things, but, um, and directors and, you know, mentors, but yeah, it has been a lot more, you know, trying to help them with what I call just life skills coping skills, you know, just helping them understand that they're not alone and that there are ways that we can all help ourselves. Like think about how all of us are dealing with this. They're yeah. dealing with it similarly. They're, they're just adult. They're just smaller versions of us that don't have as much of the world experience to aid them in how to process this. And for some of them, school was the only place that they had that was consistent and, you know, gave them structure, gave like, you know, uh, we always yeah. joke that it's yeah. the kids that you don't want to see that are always there every single day. Well, there's a reason for that, you know, and not yeah. that we don't want to see yeah. them, but, you yeah. know, so they just, yes, I, I feel like 
I have been wearing that hat a lot more recently than trying to help them with their sentence structures. Not that I'm not doing that too, but um, we're still writing like yeah. gangbusters. But um, but yeah, I'm doing a lot more of that. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. No, and I, I hear that a lot from educators that there are so many of them that they're the one thing they're really missing the most are their kids. Um, and, you know, the, like the whole, you know, like they're, the kids have become part of their lives. And, and I see like a lot of things that of not just the ch children's lives, it's their whole fam family's life. Like, you know, how we're trying to help uh, families that, you know, depend on the school lunch programs by making sure that, you know, they're still getting meals delivered to them. And now I've heard about Wi-Fi buses going around. So, you know, this large part of their life, you know, we need to, you know, try to keep that together however we can. Well, thanks for that. Um, well, Matt, let me turn, turn over to you here. And obviously we've got families that have kids of all ages. Like I've got some, some families I work with that have six children and I really pray for them right now, <laughs> having them all, or I should say cheers to the whole family. Um, but, you know, so, you know, let's talk about, you know, like if you've got, let's, let's put some strategy out there. You know, we've obviously, a lot of us still are connecting with the outside world because we have jobs that are taking us outside, but how can we manage having, you know, our job and teaching the kids, helping the kids to be successful? How can we put all this together? And is there a kind of strategy that we can work with this? Um, well, I think the strategy is, is, and, and, and I will be specific about middle school and, and high school. I think elementary school is a whole different ball game, and I'm going to totally leave that to David to talk about, um, <laughs> <laughs> because that is so not my forte. <laughs> me small neither. Me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think, yeah, there, there are lots of strategies. Um, number one, I think, is just like, ask, you know, ask your kid, have you checked in with the teacher? What's the teacher saying? Show me, you know, there's so many ways with all the technology that's been developed for students like Canvas and Google Classroom. There's so many ways for parents to be added to that technology that's already there, just like they can easily be added on PowerSchool, just like, you know, they can easily sign up to basically be a shadow on Canvas. So anything that's sent to their child also gets copied to their email address, stuff like that. So if your right, child says, right, right, no, right. I haven't had any assignments assigned in the past six weeks, be like, mm, no, that's not true, you know. So there's an easy <laughs> way to follow up. And just Dang, also, like, you guys saw through our strategies. Right. But also see, like, <laughs> what is the teacher sending out? Well, that's not making sense. Or this does feel like too much work. Or that doesn't, I don't understand. And my child doesn't understand. You know, then you've already got something where you can reach out to that teacher. All those emails and messages, announcements that come out, are they're all reply messages, you know, where the email, you can just reply to the email announcement that you got, and it goes straight back to the teacher. Um, and then I think the other thing that parents need to know is teaching has changed so much in the past decade as, as way more than it has over the past 50 years. Um, and, you know, one of the things I was talking to my sister-in-law about is she said, you know, it's really hard because I, I'm trying to keep she's trying to keep my two nieces away from each other uh, like so they don't fight too much you know but she says i you know I, I said well what's your schedule well i sit them down and i have them do their work in the morning and then i give them some you know social time and then they go clean something and then i sit them down again and, the, and i said oh well the best thing to do then is get them away from each other when one's sitting down to do work you can focus on that one while the other one goes to do their cleaning project and then that way by the end of the day when they're going outside to play with each other they haven't been around each other all day um, you know, I think what a lot of parents need to know is that as teachers, the big thing that we've been taught these days is it's no longer a lecture series. It's everybody comes together at the beginning. We have a bell ringer or something to get them focused or even just announcements at the beginning of a class. We give them the information and then we say, go do it. And they spread out. They're in groups. They're individual. Um, Nicole's been down my hallway in the middle of a middle school classroom and all my kids are outside in the hallway belting at the top of their lungs against the wall <laughs> practicing for themselves with one head. It's not point. weird. It's not I'm, it's the normal. It's not weird. It's totally yeah. cool. It's yeah. totally cool. Yeah. But there's like 30 eighth graders belting at the top of their lungs, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's the thing. Like we give them the pieces, we send them away to go do stuff on their own. So parents don't have to feel like they have to hover around their kids the whole time. If you just give them the freedom to do it and let them ask you questions, then they're usually okay. And then you bring them back together at the end of the assignment. 
you know, I think some of the parents, you know, maybe we're going back to our days as children. And I think maybe this is some of the issues that we're having. You know, um, everybody, you know, makes a joke about common core math and everything. But the fact of the matter is, is that we don't learn the same way that today that we used no. to when we were in school. No, we really <laughs> don't. Um, it's it's not only is it we don't learn the same way, um, it's taught a different way. And it's taught a different way mm -hmm. because we don't learn the same way. You know, when when we were growing up, um, it, the best the best piece of, of technology I had was a TI eighty one calculator, and to this day I still have no idea how to use that thing. <laughs> but, but I mean, we so we were expected to be able to pay attention to an hour long lecture because we didn't have Instagram and. Facebook and all the old right. people stuff, you know, we, so we did have longer attention spans and kids today don't have that. Adults today don't have that. Our entire society has changed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, things have been adapted to that. When I got my teaching degree 20 years ago, the stuff that they were teaching then, some of it's applic applicable now and some of it's not. We have just, the three of us have just had to pick it up and adapt as, as times change. Exactly. Yeah, times times are changing, but you know some of these these uh, tried and true strategies I think can still work. You know, as far as like you're saying, separate the kids, put them together later in the day. You know, things like that, like some some basic math there, so to speak. Um, and if, but let me toss that over to. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say I think the biggest thing a parent can do when a kid says I don't get it is yeah. just yeah. say, then you explain it to me. Yes, that is exactly the best strategy okay. you can employ. And it's so hard Let because- Let them like, teach you. Exactly, because a lot of times, and A, it empowers the kids obviously, but B, it, it's not a yes or no question. It's not a, well, what do you think this or this? The more open-ended questions you can ask your kids, the more you allow them to talk and figure out and express and grab the words. And a lot of times as an adult, you can see where, okay, that some, how did they make that jump to there? That doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can you can troubleshoot it in that regard. Absolutely, and every help them, help them bridge that gap of whatever it is that they don't understand. Exactly. That's that's, that's good stuff. Well, well, David, let's let's ask you. Um, you know, on on the other side of the of you know of the spectrum, so to speak, that we're looking at. You know, sorry, sorry. I had to. You know, it just it popped in my head. I couldn't get rid of it, so I had to say it. <laughs> but um, but for the kids that learn differently, you know, one of the things that you know it keeps it's been kind of gnawing at me the last few days is the model of John Crossland school, you know, belong, believe, succeed. And, you know, and, and so I, you know, I'm thinking of these kids that you're working with that, you know, having routines, having something they can depend on every single day, that reliability brings them a lot of confidence in the world. And, you know, now that we're kind of pulled away from that in the world that we're currently in, you know, how are those kids adapting to it? And, and, you know, how, what kind of, you know, what kind of things have you been hearing as far as the changes in these kids now that we're all kind of in our inner lockdown state? Mm -hmm. Well, our students are, you know, as varied as any other school, really. They all have learning disabilities or learning differences, but um, that could be dyslexia for one student. It could be ADHD. It could be someone who's on the autism spectrum. And of course, a lot of really specific reading disorders and, and other things kind of all along this huge pathway. Basically, what that means is just an overarching turn that says, I need more, su more support when I'm learning. That's, that's what LD really means. Um, and so some of them are picking up to it like a fish in water. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know. Um, like, uh, I guess, yeah. Our school is really lucky, probably because we are, A, because we are an independent school, and B, because we are very small. Um, we only lost one day of instruction time, and we've been doing um, Google Meets, classrooms, um, since the second day of the stay-at-home order, basically. Um, yeah. So uh, some students who are actually striving in this environment and maybe doing better than they do in, in the traditional classroom. Other students, this is a real challenge for because the connectivity is not there and um, there's some real self-esteem battles that go on. Um, I, I, I took notes before we came on here because I'm forgetful. <laughs> and you, you said the first word I wrote on my uh, sheet, which was routine. Um, yeah. Routine is so important in the classroom, but if there's no classroom any longer, it's step one in succeeding at home, setting up a routine. 
Um, we uh, created a schedule. Our, we actually have scheduled meets every day. So they go from first period to second period to third period with breaks in between. Um, and um, the first step was creating, and this was from our incredible administration team, creating um, and sending out a schedule to every student. And we asked parents to print it out and to post it in their work environment um, so that they know this is my time where I have to be in math, God help us all. And uh, after that, I get a five minute break and then I get to go to band class, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the entire day. Um, the other thing I really wanted to bring up was environment that we need to have a space for learning, especially, you know, we think of these uh, younger kids really, we have to stay on top of them, but truly they need a, a dedicated space. It may be on the other side of the, of the dining room table, but everyone needs a space where, where they can work, where they feel comfortable. So there's some comfortable elements, but where it's not too snoozy, too sleepy, um, where they can really get something accomplished, right? Uh, and again, that posted schedule. And then I think the third part of creating a successful student at home is expectation. Um, you know, teachers are great at this. Teachers are great at saying, this is what I want from you. If we're here, we have to get you to here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's something that I think parents battle on a lot. I expect the dishes to be clean mm -hmm. and, and it may not mean the same thing. So the expectation, I, I think for everyone really has to be kind of set related to growth mindset. Growth mindset just meaning um, the goal is to get further than you were before to learn some new information. So it's not necessarily I expect you to be, um, you know, I, I expect you making great progress in this time we're at home. That may be not feasible for every student, even every typical student. Um, but instead, right. our goal is to learn more and to become better every day. That's great. I, I oh no, Kathy went away. Should I keep talking, you guys? Well, you know, actually, I want to. I want to go on a point that you said. Um, yeah. You, you, you said. <laughs> That, yeah, that way. I'm over here. Okay. Um, yeah, structure is important, and um, and I think that uh, when That's when, when ah, she's back. Um, <laughs> structure is definitely important, um, but also I think parents should realize that the structure that they get at school will not be the same structure that they get at home. So do look at the schedule that the school sent out. Because at first when I looked at the schedule, I was like, well, my class isn't an hour anymore. My class is only like 30 minutes. And I'm like, that, I mean, that makes sense. You know, there's no way that I can keep them engaged for an hour and a half over Zoom and, and then have them go to Ms. Halbison's Zoom for an hour and a half. You know, it's not going to happen. So it is a shortened schedule for a reason. So just, you know, go through that structure and realize that your structure will be different and find out what works for you in your household yeah. because you know your kids really well. And you, if you know you're going to push their buttons with the schedule, then fix it right. and, you know, and, and make it accommodating for right. everyone involved so you're not battling all the time. Right. Flex I mean, flexibility. Uh, it needs to fit into your schedule as well. I mean, mm -hmm. so many of our parents are working from home. So, you know, yeah. your lunch hour may be the read-together time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you need to schedule things and, and, you know, space out the things that are challenging space out the things that are really uh, mentally taxing so that they're not doing all the hardest work from 10 to 12. That That's that's tough. That's tough for me to yeah. do. If I was a worker and I had all of my hardest things in those two hours, I'd probably have to take a nap in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I still do. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds like a good plan to me. <laughs> You know, and, and so we're trying to set our kids up for success here, but, you know, there are some sometimes, and granted, I know that, David, that, you know, the parents of a lot of the students that you have, they're pretty well tied in, keyed into what their kids are experiencing, doing what challenges they personally have. But there may be some, you know, some things where some stress signals, some some things they're showing you that they're that the kids are frustrated, that may be very nuanced that parents aren't picking up. So what kind of things can a parent look for to say, you know what, maybe I'm pushing this kid a little too hard. Number one is always avoidance in my mind. And that mm -hmm. can take a lot of different shapes. Um, but avoidance just means anything they can do that, that puts the work off. Hopefully mm -hmm. it will be forgotten or hopefully it will be done at a time when I feel better. So um, distraction is a big thing. You know, uh, if they're trying to constantly find it out, well, maybe they need a five minute break or they need to run around the house or something like that. But if they're coming up with constant distraction and it almost seems like they're hunting for distraction, that's a sign of frustration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
Uh, anger is an obvious one mm -hmm. when kids are really like, I'm not gonna sit here and do this. Okay, well then you probably mm -hmm. need to back off and let them do something else. Do not fight. Don't butt heads with kids. That's what we learn as teachers. You know what? All right, we gotta do something different for a minute. Um, defeatism and this kind of like idea of like, well, I'm just not capable. I can't do this. I don't understand. I'll never understand. Really, that's a type of avoidance as well in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, how do I change the focus from what we're working on in, into anything that's different? All right. So um, when they start getting defeated, uh, it would be a great time to review something they're comfortable with or research something that they're passionate about, especially with some of our mm -hmm. folks who have really specific passions. Give them a moment to, you know, browse the internet and find something, you know, about, I don't know, baseball. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, um, whatever and, it is, yeah. Um, and sleepiness. You know, sleepiness is really an indicator at our school, when, it, um, uh, especially with our younger kids, when a child's really kind of like pulling back and literally falling asleep in their chair. It might be that they didn't get enough sleep. That's very possible in a time where screens are so common. But um, it's also possible that that's a sign of mental fatigue, that, th that they need a moment away. And there is you know, such a and thing honestly, as Zoom fatigue. Like, mm -hmm. um, I just yeah. read an article about it. I'm experiencing it personally. The Zoom fatigue is really getting to me, the screen mm -hmm. fatigue. And um, our kids, even though we think, I think this is a big misconception between generations, we think just because they were born with a phone in their hand that they don't experience this technological exhaustion, but they, they really do. And you couple that with this disruption of routine, this this disruption of normalcy. And, and I just wanted to, to comment on what David said. It's like, kids are also grieving right now. They are frustrated, but they're also grieving their loss of normalcy. And grief in children so many times comes out in exactly the same things that David just said, anger, avoidance, and avoidance in all of those different forms. And you know, really as a parent and as a teacher, as much like that's the problem right now that I'm having is I'm not with them like I usually am every day where I can see and hear, you know, being on a Zoom chat, even if they're, even if they have their audio and video on, it's a different interaction. So cues and things that I usually can pick up yeah. on to know that they're struggling, to know that they're having a tough day emotionally, I can't. And so as the parents are in the home with them now, where we used to be in school with them all day, right? picking up on those signals and just trying to find a way to reroute that emotion and that energy and say, okay, can we just talk? Like, can we talk? Or do you, like David said, do you want to go find something else? In my opinion, now is a great time to redirect the conversation about what learning means and what education means and that it doesn't have to be just sitting in a classroom in front of a book or a screen that you can teach your kids some, a recipe that you love to make. You can teach your kids how to change the tire on the car, if you know how. Mm -hmm. You can teach them how to garden. You can <laughs> teach them how to do laundry. Like all these adulting skills that people say, we're not teaching them. Well, here's a great time to learn. And, but I mean, you know honestly, what, it's never, <laughs> it's never, say, too it's never too old to do, it's never too late to do what, what Montessori school started kids with. You know, because all the basic skills of, you know, those types of things, you know, this is just but an not, older version. Of yeah. That. But if nothing well, else, you know, it shows them that learning is important to you and that learning is not just books and not just writing right. essays and not just sitting in front of something, memorizing facts, that learning is happening all the time. And if you feed your learning engine with different things all day, you're going to become a learner and you're going to get that curiosity. And, and that's and, and the defeatism the older kids are really struggling with right now that, well, it doesn't matter. They're not going to give us grades or they can't do this or this, the year is basically over and they're very, very defeated and um, trying to inspire any spark of wanting to, okay, let's learn this then. What do you want to look at? What do yeah. you want to research is really important. I think. While we're talking about zoom fatigue. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt. I also want to bring up choice fatigue, which is a real thing. Yes. Um, and they and, have it right now. <laughs> yeah, where, where, you know, oh, well, even simple things like what do you want for breakfast? You know, that's ultimately a choice. Um, and that brings back this idea of routine and a printed schedule mm -hmm. and how important that really is. Um, you can't say to them every day, 
well, do you want to start with math or do you want to start with reading? Yeah. Because ultimately that's right. a choice and these choices add up and they're going to wear out so much faster when you just meet with them on Sunday and say, all right, this is our schedule for next week. We agree to it now. This is what we're doing. And we're set. Mm-hmm. That's great. And monitor and adjust. <laughs> One of the yeah. things that I like that Nicole was saying was, um, <clears throat> you know, that this is a great time to teach them about um, washing laundry and, and loading the dishwasher and, you know, life skills. I think right. this is right. also yeah. a great time because so many people are having a hard time out there. This is also a great time to teach them about kindness and helping other people mm -hmm. who who are less fortunate. Mm -hmm. and I think there are plenty of homes that are doing okay out there. And you want to break up the monotony? I I, one of our families at our school is making sandwiches by the hundreds and taking them to local shelters. And you can just call the shelter and ask, what should I make? What should I not make? And it's real simple. I think it was like ham, turkey, mayonnaise, and mustard on white bread. And you just package them all up, you know, make sure it's sanitary, and you do it. And they're taking them and they show the picture of the counter just completely spread out. These are people who had a couple of extra dollars and they broke up that monotony by having their their two daughters do something helpful and feel something for it you know so do that show them that yeah. there is a world yeah. outside the door you don't have to keep them indoors yeah i have students I, writing I think letters to people in nursing homes yeah yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. They're, they're writing letters to people in nursing homes who can't have visitors right now um, wow. And it's just because I saw it on Instagram. I was like, you know what? This is a nice thing. And so many of them have said, hey, I sent th I sent three letters today. And I was like, I didn't know you knew what stamps were. So <laughs> 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 I was so proud. <laughs> that is awesome. I mean, you guys are those those kids are I mean, think about how how that will impact. It, it's like a, a little like a pebble in a, in a stream or something. And, and it just the waves, like how it's going to impact the world is such a small little task, you know, small little thing that these kids are doing. It's going to change their life. It really is. Yeah. Well, if you can grow their hearts now. I think so. Yeah. But do you think, let me, let me ask you, throw this out to you, Matt. Do you think that throwing in some of these life skills and opening their hearts a little bit, do you think that's going to be part of the face of how education is going to change for the long haul? Because obviously everything's going to change. We're not going back to normal. This is, and I hate the phrase new normal, so I'm, I refuse to say it because it's so over said. Yeah. I, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, when, when every, the life gets back to what we can semblance of what we call normal, do you think that, you know, some of this stuff will carry through and how do you see education changing? Um, I'll be honest. I see it changing for the worse before it gets better. Um, there's a bill right now in the house that a lot of teachers are very angry about that they're, that they're proposing to draw up in the house. A lot of teachers are very angry about, um, that has to do with, uh, they want by the month of July, June or July, they want to know how schools are going to hold teachers responsible for teaching at home next year. If we have a hybrid schedule, it's like, but we, we barely got time to do this. You know? Like we were, lit especially... Oh yeah, especially theater and music teachers, we were taught how to interact with our kids in the space, not over a Zoom right. conference where we can't even have a rehearsal mm -hmm. together. So um, right. I think right. that there's right. steps that will be taken for sure. And I think missteps will be taken as well. You know, um, I saw I saw a meme today that said, um, dear healthcare workers, I'm sorry the politicians think they know how to do their job better than you. Love teachers. <laughs> like, oh. yeah, that's that's been a narrative oh. in the teacher's life. It's been a narrative in our in teachers' life for years. And there are great politicians out there. Don't, don't get me wrong. Jeff Jackson is a huge supporter of teachers. You know, we love him. But um, yeah. yeah, I think there'll be some missteps. But overall, how is it going to change? I think for the, right off the bat, students are going to start are probably going to stop saying I hate school. <laughs> <laughs> even even those uh, kids who I, are just that's real. what it's a real Seriously. thing yeah. yeah oh anytime yeah. they get frustrated you know and the, the yeah. snapback is always going to be well we can go back to covid and see if you like it oh. <laughs> be careful what yeah, you no, wish for gonna... that's right. Right. <laughs> i mean it's just it i think there's gonna be a lot more appreciation um mm -hmm. i think that now that parents are seeing what it takes to teach their child, not that they're going to keep yeah. doing it at that level because they want to leave it to the teachers to do for sure and get back to work as well. Um, but I think that they also uh, will 
hopefully be more involved and, and you know, set up those shadow accounts on Google and Canvas and say, hey, your teacher said you're supposed to do this by Thursday. Did you, what have you actually done? You know, mm -hmm. I think it would get a lot easier for them to just check up on them a little bit more than they did before. That's my hope. Just to be and I'm hoping that some of these, I'm hoping some of these, some of these folks at the at legislative level in our government here, that they had to homeschool a lot of their children, and they had tons of children to to educate during this time frame, and they didn't have anyone to help, because then when everything goes back to the normal, so to speak, um, maybe then teachers will get a pay raise because they'll realize just how valuable you guys are. <laughs> Because they don't want to do it any more than you do. <laughs> Listen, the three of us know not to hold our breath for that. <laughs> and yeah, the fact is, really as, like many, as many missteps have, as there have been around education and, and, and politics, um, we've we've learned our way around them, you know, because right. no matter what, we've always said, look, this is what's being handed down. We're going to do this, but here's our way of doing it because we love you guys and we, you know, sincerely want you to learn and we're here for you all the time. Like Nicole said, we don't just teach. We've always been mentors. We've always been coaches. You know, we're just, that's part of the job and we know that and it's part of the gig and we're going to continue yeah. to do that. And when the missteps happen, it'll be one more to, you know, add to the tally and we'll just keep doing what we do best. I think if there's anything that will change from this, I think, um, I hope, and we're very lucky at Crosland. We, we don't have these issues here. Our parents are terrific, like Kathy said, they have to be engaged. But I think parents are going to understand more of their role in education as well. Um, now that they have to be a part of the process, hopefully they'll continue to be a part of the process like Matt said, and um, understand that learning doesn't just happen from eight until three. Right. right. No, it's it's a constant, you know, and it's, and you know, I actually have my undergraduate degree in sociology and there was a landmark case that was based on a sociological study, um, which was Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, back in the 60s. And, you know, most people remember that case being part of desegregation and what caused desegregation in schools. And the thing was, the sociologist was misunderstood because he looked at it from the perspective of latchkey kids um, that would come home and no one would pay them any attention. And then, you know, the suburbia, you know, family with Donna Reed there waiting with milk and cookies. And the bottom line of his study was it wasn't a matter of what the children had or didn't have in the community. It was a matter of if the children felt like like someone cared about them and that what they were doing mattered to someone. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm hearing a lot of that right here, you know, with you guys saying that, you know, that community involvement, the, the parents knowing that they're taking an active role in their child's education in the future. I think that's going to be big. But uh, I tell you what, Nicole, I, I hope so. I, I really do, too. Now, now Nicole, like, any final thoughts, any recommendations that you have? to parents just trying to get through and survive this without pulling out all their hair. You know, and again, I have older students, so everything is different. And hopefully parents know their children or they're getting to know them and they have been getting to know them in ways that I think are, you know, new and interesting and maybe sides of them that we kept saying, no, this is who your child is. And they're like, that's not my child. And they're like, this is my child, for better or worse. Um <laughs> What I, what I think the, bis, the biggest advice is check in with yourselves and check in with your kids. Be as honest as you can be. Be positive, but be honest. It's okay to tell your kids that you're worried. It's okay to be honest with them and say, yeah, I don't have a lot of answers, but that's okay. We can still work through this. We can work through our feelings. We can work through our uncertainties because what this is, is a, this has been a crash course for some people, adults and children alike, in coping and whether or not they have the skills to do so. And this loss of community, I hope, does reawaken a sense of community in us when we finally can have that community back into a more normal way. And also, my advice would be, parents, please don't see us as some kind of combatant. Please don't see teachers as some kind of enemy especially since before a lot of my parents, I was a voice on the phone or a message on an email screen. And now it's all of my parents that's that way. So, you know, please don't see your teachers as some sort of enemy. Do you really honestly think that we would be doing what we do for the amount of pay that we get if we did not love your kids? 
and we didn't want to see them be the best people that they can be. We want the same thing that you want for them. We want them to be happy and healthy and safe. And, you know, yeah. for those parents that feel overwhelmed, and I know that there's a lot of them out there and are at their wits end, please reach out to your school. Please tell your teachers, ask for help for yourself and say, I don't know what to do and I'm struggling to help my child. We're not going to come at you with judgment. We're not going to come at you. And, you know, and that's a hard thing for parents to acknowledge sometimes that they, you know, because that it's hard for any person to acknowledge that you don't know. And there's a lot of pride in that. And there's a lot of don't tell me how to teach my kid. We are here to help. We really, really are. So please treat us as a resource and a, and a someone working with you and things will go so much better and we'll be able to do really wonderful things for your kids. I love that. That's awesome. Oh, you're my teacher. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you would never feel the same about English. I'm just saying. <laughs> My mother would be thrilled. And I know she's watching this. So mom's at home pointing at the television set saying, yes, absolutely. Correct that child's English. <laughs> I'm not a grammar Nazi. I'm very kind. <laughs> yeah. Google for that now. <laughs> yeah, they have Google for that now. They don't need me. They have Grammarly. They still need me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We need you. We need you. Big time. We need you. Now, David, what's your, your words of wisdom, you know, as far as uh, for these parents that are you know, trying to get through this time frame to help their kids succeed and be happy in the process. I'm going to go back to what you brought up when you mentioned the John Carlson School, our catchphrase of belong, believe, succeed, um, that that's really necessary. It's, it's, a, it's a list, you know, it's not three things. It, you have to have those first two to be able to succeed. So belonging is meaning you're having a place. And I want to bring up social uh, interaction. Um, because, oh, Kathy's gone. I'm going to keep talking about social interaction uh, because we know in the long run that um, these Zoom meetings with between peers, it's it's not going to be enough, it, it, that, that this is going to wear out and that there will have to be other things. Um, so don't be afraid to go back to calling your best friend, um, spending time on the phone, writing email, writing letters, because the those uh, forms of communication are actually more pure than, than the video conferencing, believe it or not. Sometimes with the video stuff, we get kind of weird mixed cues and it can really kind of play on your self-esteem. I think Nicole brought that up. It's part of that Zoom fatigue. Um, and believing in yourself and and singing, you know, singing those praises and, and working towards a, a greater goal. Um, you, you have to be able to, you have to believe you can succeed before you will be able to. Wow, that's some good stuff. Um, Matt, I'm going to ask you if you want to say anything now. <laughs> <laughs> David, yeah, our moderator. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that uh, I, I really like what one of my parents said the other day online. Um, he said, you know, we've been talking about how how our healthcare workers are the real heroes here. And sure, they are. And um, But he said, I think that they there are lots of heroes right now in the world. He said, and I think that we need to acknowledge that these children are heroes because um, like you all said earlier, their world's been turned upside down and here they are in front of a computer, ready to learn, following the teacher's directions, you know, trying to actually make it through math problems they don't understand and reading excerpts that they don't have the attention span for and, you know, right now because of everything going on. And I think that um, parents, if you treat your kids like, like they are heroes on the front line and understand that and lift them up, I think they're more willing to um, to reach out to your expectations and, and try to fulfill them more, you know, just appreciate what they're going through. It's it's not just the parents going through it; it's your children also. Treat them as heroes. Wow, wow, that guys, this is to me. This has been a very eye opening in a way um, in regards to education, and it's also been very inspiring. And you know, I, I hope everybody watching this is finding a sense of hope and you know, in the fact that you are shaping the minds of tomorrow and. And well, thank you, Kathy. We really appreciate that. And we really appreciate you having us on today. <laughs> it's been wonderful. It's been, yeah, great. Nice to meet you both. Well, Matt, I've already met you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, Nicole. Yes, we, we yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, very nice. All right, all right. Let's see if this shows up again. Hello there. And, and I, I apologize, guys. We're working with a storm here. I'm watching outside the window of my office. The trees are literally going sideways. Yep. So I have a feeling that might be some of my issues here. 
I just watched two birds go by my window screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if a cow goes sideways, I'm sorry, I'm cutting the broadcast. <laughs> But, you know, the, the thing is, guys, it, listening to each one of you talk about your students and talk about your passion for education and knowing that, you know, the minds and hearts of tomorrow are, you know, being shaped by you guys. It, it's really it makes me feel good, you know, to know that, you know, you guys are out there on the front lines with our with their kids and helping them to just be the best version of themselves they possibly can be. And that to me gives me a lot of hope and, you know, a lot of joy knowing that you know that you guys are having such a great time doing this and i hope that you guys can get back with your oh, we do too yeah okay we definitely do <laughs> yeah yeah but guys I, I typically would be zipping around here on the final broadcast the final part of this broadcast but uh with the internet issues i think i'm just going to call it thank you, goodbye type of thing. So again, just remember that one small little good deed for someone, it may seem like nothing to you, but you really can change somebody's life. So thank you again for tuning into uh, Village, the Village Voice. And I'm your host, Kathy Smith. And be sure to tune in on Friday, which hopefully we won't have as much craziness with the internet going on. We'll, when we'll actually be talking to some restaurateurs and some folks that are in the supply lines of the food chain. So you definitely want to tune in for that. You know, granted, we won't be on the, the, the corner pub and join Thanks again. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.